My name is Gert Drapers. I'm one of the engineering leaders uh, of Puppet. I'm also managing the Seattle development office that we just started in August. With me is uh, Scott, who is an engineer on my team, who is responsible for all the cloud and container stuff. So we're going to team up today. And then actually, uh, later today, Scott is going to do a deep dive. So uh, just so you know, it's like if you don't get all your questions answered, that's it. Uh, a little bit about me, because I only joined Puppet for six months now. I came out of Microsoft, where I spent 24 years of my life, probably too long, but um, worked on things like SQL Azure, Xbox Live was the last thing where I run all the services, where I got introduced to CI, CD, and DevOps in a big way. And then I transitioned to HP, where I worked on Cloud Foundry, uh, containerized Cloud Foundry, so I can actually run Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes, and that's how we shipped it. So that's part of, of me. That's, that's not about me, right? It's about containers. Um, now, this picture is not coincidental. Right, containers are interesting things. These are probably not the ones you're looking for, given that you're coming to this talk. But there actually is some reason behind this picture. Because a lot of people look at containers, and I've heard people talk, even at the conference, in the form of, oh, it's just a different shape of a VM. And part of my talk and why I wanted to have this talk is to actually talk through is like how this is actually different. Because um, containers is like, if you treat them like VMs, you're only going to get this far. And that's not going to be productive. And it's going to get you into a dead end street. And what I want to prevent is that you're actually ending up in that street. So anyhow, so let's look at the container evolution. Right. It's like there's a lot, a lot of talk. It's like every Docker con is bigger. I've been to all of them. And it's like every year, more, more people. And every year, I think, it's like this is going to be the year that it's like this is the breakthrough. But really, this all started many moons ago with change root. Right. The ability to actually ch provide a process with its own isolated file system and be able to start working from there is like enabled a lot of the foundation that we're building upon. There is a lot that happened. And you see, it's like change root was like introduced in 79. It's like the first versions of process isolation really is like only came in around the 2000 timeframe. Jails, it's like Solaris, HPUX did a lot of work in this area. LXC was a big step forward, which was then picked up by Cloud Foundry to build their hosting version and warden out of this. All right, let me containerize this for you. Was another initiative that actually came out of and took some tech from Google. Until then, it's like Docker came and actually started working on this. And so it's, the point is, it's like, it's not all that new. We're building on very core OS primitives. The thing is, these days, it's a lot more usable. And that's what actually made the change and started people making it that they used it, which is thanks to Docker. All right, Docker introduced us to some core capabilities focusing on what I would call the format, the ability to package your applications in a meaningful way, helping you create a workflow that allows you to package your application up and to ultimately get to a state that you're having high repeatability and therefore high velocity. And that's what we're seeking for, right? If you look at this morning's keynote, the recurring theme is how do I make things fa go faster? How do I deliver faster? How do I deliver more reliable? How do I allow my teams to make mistakes? And the only way you can make mistakes in an affordable fashion, and this is what I tell my teams, you're allowed to make mistakes. Please make them. Because if you make them, it will save the customer a lot of pain. But we have to recognize them, and therefore we need to be able to cycle fast and validate fast. And that's what containers is actually allowing us to do. Now, in order to host a set of containers, and you've seen probably this picture many times over, all right, but I wanted to point out a couple of things. 
because I picked up on a couple of conversations in the expo hall and while I was meeting with customers where there is still confusion about is like, how does this all layer? Where does this all sit? Everybody is familiar these days with VMs. Right? A hypervisor running a set of guest OS, providing a degree of isolation that you're comfortable with and that you know how to provision these days. Now, containers actually take some of these layers out. You're running on a shared kernel. There are some advantages to that. That gives it the flexibility and the leanness of, this, of the environment. And it allows you to drive isolation through the core principles of which we're building on at the operating system level. All, right. All the resource separation that you can get from U names, network resources, processor resources, et cetera, are enabling you to start building this up. But you still have to remember that you're running on a shared kernel. That's not going to change. All right. Now, the most important thing, as I said, is like, what is enabling all the goodness in a container? Well, from my perspective, it's the ability to package up an application. It's to use that as an artifact that's being produced by an automation pipeline, by a CI pipeline, by a developer who is building something. How many of you are actually using containers in your build process? More than expected. Right. One of the things is like I'm I'm very supportive of, right? In my own development environment, how do you create your development environment repeatable? So we actually, while we were, so I'm responsible for discovery. It's one of the things I'm res responsible for. And right before we got ready with the the, the payload that we actually made available uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday, sorry, it's a little bit of a blur. Um, is that it's like we had to deal with the security update from Go. So Go had to ship 9.1, um, 191, because there was a security update. And so the team updated the Golang compiler accordingly, but not every developer apparently got the message. Now, if we would be building and had containerized our compiler stack, I would have not have that problem. Because I would simply have invoked my build, it would have pulled down my new container, and everybody would be on the same state. And that's how you drive consistency and repeatability, but also quick onboarding of new developers. And that's enabled by the fact that it's like you actually have a format in which you can stop things. So the format is actually layered. And one of the key things, and but also key differentiators between a Linux container and a Windows container is actually the file system. All right, a Linux container is this, like, is this layered setup where you have your bootfs, where it's like you are building up a base image, and the top of the container is only writable at the point in time. If you start adding layers, for example, let's assume you're going to build your React app, and you need yarn for some reason, so you stuff the yarn layer in there, and then you put Node.js in there, which is a little bit bigger. All right. You're going to stack these layers up, and these layers indirectly are referencing their parents. And the reason for that is that I now have causality tracking of what is actually going on in my container, and I can figure out it's like where I am and what I'm exactly using. So now if you take another image, for example, take Alpine as a base image, and you can start to repeat that story running on the same kernel. The key thing here, though, is by doing this, by having a layered approach, by only bringing in the things that we need, we can start actually building out a workflow. And the core thing about that is, is that how do we actually make our, how do we go faster? As I said earlier, you go faster by making your life repeatable. And by making it repeatable, you need to know, it's like, what actually is our, am I building? And what am I deploying? And if I can get to this single artifact, so I can go from source to an artifact, simple as like, there are other ways, but it's like to take a Docker build, take your source code, push it into your repository, or your registry, sorry. And then you start testing it. 
you're testing it, you run your validation, you promote it to staging and ultimately to production. Why is this important? First of all, the artifact that you built is the artifact that you tested, is the artifact that you staged, is the artifact that you run in production. That is very key. There is another subtlety though, and that subtlety is, you never run, or patch, sorry, an ex a running container. You simply don't do that. What do you do? You make a change, you commit it, you build it, you push a new version in the registry, and you deploy the new version of the container. The reason why I'm harping on this is because that workflow is 180 degree difference than how you are managing your VMs today. And that's why it's like it's very important to recognize that once you go into a container world, into a cloud native world, your workflow needs to facilitate and leverage the benefits of a container environment. All right. Now, a single container doesn't do a lot. It's nice. You can run Node.js or you can run Nginx. It's all cool. But how many of your applications are made out of one thing? Anybody? No. It's much more complex. Our lives are much more complex than that. You need databases. You need some queuing. You need all sorts of services. So now it's like we're getting into the next problem. Containers are just a building block. I now need to start orchestrating. This is, by the way, the Dutch Philharmonic Orchestra, in case you're wondering who it is, is. and you're always like, who are those folks? It's like, I'm Dutch, so that's why. It's like, <laughs> supporting my country this way. <laughs> But at the end of the day, it's like in order to do something meaningful, we need to start orchestrating our containers. That means containers need to talk to each other. Ah, now I have a networking challenge. Are these containers running on the same host or are they running on different hosts? Am I going to network to a peer-to-peer -peer networking system? All questions that you need to go answer. And as you can see, there's a lot of things that are actually going on inside the container ecosystem. The container ecosystem is evolving super quickly. And the Linux Foundation actually jumped into this and started driving a degree of standardization, which is highly needed. Because right now, as much as I love Docker and all the work that they've done for the community in terms of facilitating and making this great workflow available to all of us. You cannot have a single vendor who has a commercial interest driving a specification. So right now there's like there's a couple of initiatives going on with regards to standardization of the format as well as the runtime environments. But also around orchestration and so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is actually shepherding things like Kubernetes as an orchestration engine, Container D, and Rocket as an alternative runtime, which is great because that actually helps us stabilize and make sure that it's like we have the right components that we can build upon. But why are we doing all this? What are we looking for? Any ideas? At the end of the day, the holy grail from an application deployment point of view is if we would have immutable infrastructure. Because that allows us to go faster, to rinse and repeat, which assumes that you're replacing it during every deployment. You're not updating this. And again, that's, I said this before. But it's, if there is one thing you take away from my piece, and then you can listen to all the greatness that we have built and that Scott, his team, has built. But if there's one thing that you remember from my part, is this. Containers are replaced. They're not patched. 
All right. So how can we help? What can Puppet do? Because as much as it's an evolution for you, it's an evolution for Puppet. Puppet came out of the, the world where it's like we're managing nodes. And the transition from nodes to VMs is a very seamless one. But the transition from a VM to a container is rather different. So in order to actually do this, we kicked off a project called BlueShift, which is our incubation project. It's basically a label for all sorts of incubation projects that we have. And if you go back to May 11, when we did some big announcements, there is some work that we did that we started piloting and trying to innovate. Uh, Garrett Rushmore is one of the persons, actually, who has been doing a lot of this work. We created a, a Puppet module that allowed you to create a container image out of your Puppet manifest. So we thought, well, is that might be interesting. What did we learn from that? Well, we learned from it, it works. But is the result the desired outcome? And the answer is no. Because it gives you a container that has way too much stuff in it. It doesn't cohere to the 12 factor principles of building reusable microservices, which is what ultimately your objective is if you're trying to build a set of containers. So it's great if you want to do a quick test and you have something and you want to say, it's like I stamp it out as a container and do something, but that's it. Because if you would continue down that road and not go refactor it, you'll end up in that dead end street where I don't want you to be. We started experimenting with modules of how to provision Docker infrastructure, how to work with Kubernetes. And all that learning actually resulted in some products. So it wasn't in the keynote, but it's like if you read all the press releases, you've seen that it's like we did four big things in terms of from the container world. So we completely updated the Puppet Labs Docker module was all to get it as up to date as possible. And it's like, given how fast that community is growing and moving, there are always still things to be desired. For example, uh, supporting Docker CE, the community edition on CentOS, right, is something that is like we still need to enable. Um, we added a new building block to actually build up Kubernetes infrastructure, right, to build up that Kubernetes cluster. We added support for Helm. Helm is a package manager, one of the most popular ones, also because Microsoft is heavily sponsoring this work. And it allows you to start taking the applications that you have in your world that you created, put them in a package manager, and then deploy them. Wow, that's cool because what is now the delineation between that service that you created and installing NPT? And then Scott came up with Cream, and I will have him talk to this. So I want to bring on Scott Colton, one of my great developers that I have from Australia, and he's going to actually show you is like what he's built. So take it away, Scott. Yeah. Okay, okay cool. Um, so I'm actually going to talk a little bit technically now, but I am doing a talk later um, that will go, it's full black belt. We're going to build Kubernetes from scratch twice, once in the cloud, once locally. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is why did we do this? Um, a perfect example is Cream. So Cream actually stands for Kubernetes rules everything around me. Um, so if there's any Wu-Tang fans out there, that's where we got the name from. Um, that actually come from another guy that's not here at the moment from Sydney. He came up with the name and we really liked it. Now, why did we build Cream and what, why is it important to you? Um, the reason we actually built it was internally our team is across two time zones. We're in Belfast and we're in Sydney. Um, all the container guys are in Sydney and in Belfast they're only just learning. So, but we're going to build Kubernetes infrastructure. 
So to do development, we needed to find a way that we could spin up Kubernetes really quickly, and um, AWS was too slow. So if we were making changes to the module, and like there was a whole list of things that we wanted to give you guys when we released it, um, we would do, I would do maybe 30, 40 clusters a day. Um, spinning it up in AWS was far too slow. Um, so we had to write our own tool, and we based it around Vagrant. Um, Vagrant has some shortcomings, like it can't do asynchronous builds, but this tool allows a forks processes and allows you to do that, so it builds multiple um, machines at the same time. But basically what we wanted to do is, Kubernetes is a complex beast, we all agree. Um, there's a lot of flexibility, there's a lot of complexity, um, and everyone's going to be different about what they want. But for you, public people to pick up the module quickly, we wanted to give you an environment that you could run up straight away. So basically all you need to do to run this cluster is run this one command, rate cluster up. Rate cluster up will build a Kubernetes cluster for you. It will install Helm, it will also install block level storage named um, from Rook that gives you replicated storage using Ceph across um, local disk. Um, so straight out of the box, you've got Kubernetes in, your, we call it Kubernetes in your pocket. You've got a working production-like cluster. Um, the other thing that we thought about when we were building all this is security. Uh, in the Kubernetes um, like ecosystem, security is kind of tacked on second. I mean, even Brendan Burns from Azure brought this up at um, Container Camp in Sydney, was like, the Kubernetes people really need to work on security. If you have a look at one of the strong points Docker Swarm has over Kubernetes is the security by default. Um, now Kubernetes has RBAC, but like TLS isn't in there by default. Um, so we wanted to fix that. So we saw, saw all the stuff that we have, that Docker has, and we've built it into our Puppet module. And you're like, how can we be opinionated with security, right? Because you're, everything is going to be different for you guys. So again, we had to build another tool. So oh, that screen, let me just go to the right one. Conference Wi-Fi, oh, that's Helm. Uh, here we go. So basically, we wrote a tool. And this is the first time I've ever seen this in the Puppet module. We've got a, uh, a folder called Tooling. And in there, there's a, it's basically a Ruby gem. But we didn't want to ship it as a separate artifact, because it's got no other use in the, in the world except for running this module. So basically, what this does is you pass in um, a couple of variables, like your FQDN, the IP address of the bootstrap controller. Um, how many, at the etcd initial cluster, uh, and the kube API advertised addresses. And it will spit out a whole hierarchy file with all your security controls pre-configured for you, including SSL, bootstrap, um, bootstrap tokens, and any of the other security controls that you can add into um, Kubernetes. Um, so I haven't seen another tool out there at the moment that has that much flexibility around security as we do in Puppet. Um, so at the moment, we were a bit late to the party with like Kubernetes support. So when me and the guys were thinking about it, like, why would you use us then? Why, why wouldn't you use something like kubeadmin that's already out there, or chaos? What would make you think that this tool was better? And we had to delineate ourselves on like functionality. Um, so security was one of the big things we looked at. And then the second one was UX. Um, so we wanted to abstract complexity for you if we could. Um, but then also, if you're a power Kubernetes user, give you all the configuration in the world you need. Um, so if you have a look down here, I won't go through all of them, but here is all the different params you have. There is heaps of them. Most people don't care about that. Most people want a Kubernetes cluster that's secure. They want to make sure TLS is there. Um, so basically, if you run the tool, all you have to do to um, define a bootstrap controller is this code here. That is all to build a bootstrap controller. Um, a bootstrap controller is just a controller that the Puppet module uses to push out things like the Weave deployment, um, and if you want to install the Kube dashboard or not, um, any of the operators that we install for like block level storage. So that's the difference between a bootstrap controller and a controller. Um, now Bolt's been released, we'll probably move some of the stuff that's in the module actually to Puppet tasks because it makes sense for it to live there. Um, because it's like only you only install Weave once, right? Um, Puppet actually installs it once and then just keeps checking that it's there. Um, and because Kubernetes has the idea of state as well, um, waves the deployment. If it goes down, Kubernetes will fix it. So it will make sense to move it into Puppet tasks, which we will do for the next release. Um, then you've just got a Kubernetes controller and a worker. And that's the amount of code you need to write to get Kubernetes up and running. 
Um, I haven't seen another tool that has got that that's the user experience is, is that easy as well. Um, so that's the kind of things we were thinking about internally as a team, how we would want it to be done. Um, I've only been a Puppet for 10 months. I was working on a whole heap of container stuff as a customer before that. And I put my customer hat on really with the team and said, hey, when I did this before, um, this is what we needed. These were the pain points. And if they're the pain points we were feeling as a DevOps team, as a customer, I'm sure there's other people out there that were feeling the same thing. Um, so that's where we come up with the Kubernetes module. That's why we come up with Cream. Um, we also add it into Cream. You can deploy it. There's an AWS um, CloudFormation template. So if you don't have a laptop that's got um, because you need 12 gigs of RAM. If you don't have it, you can deploy it in AWS. It'll deploy PE um, with the free 10 node license and build a Kubernetes cluster for you. Um, but what it gives you is a playground or a sandbox that'll allow you to make production level changes before you roll it out to your production cluster. So like for example, you could run the tool and generate new certificates. You could test them on the cream um, environment. And then once you know that your cluster's all fine, you can move that horror file to your production puppet server and re-update um, all your certificates. So what we're trying to do is build a workflow end to end and give you a life cycle of how do you can control Kubernetes from an operations point of view. But then we also had to look after developers. Um, so we bootstrapped Helm. Um, what Helm allows you to do is deploy applications, define applications, and allows you to deploy applications um, in a formatted way. And as I said, as Gert mentioned, uh, Microsoft has backed it massively. Um, Brandon Burns from Azure is actually, uh, pushing it really, really hard. And for the first time, I think Puppets jumped on board something really early on in the piece um, where we'll actually see the community around Helm grow. Um, and I've just got a quick demo here where we can see that um, Helm is, this is just Cream running locally. Helm is not only for application developers. I've actually just um, deployed the block level storage with Ceph with uh, a Kubernetes operator using Helm. So that wouldn't be something that an application developer as such would look at, but we're in the world at the moment where what is an application developer? And we've had this talk internally. Um, is someone that writes code all day for infrastructure-related um, tasks an application developer? Like I spend my whole day writing either Puppet code or Go code or Ruby code, but I don't write actual applications that would be called traditional applications. Like is Cream a traditional application? Um, so there's a blurry line at the moment of what an application developer is. And as that line is going to get blurred and blurred and blurred going forward, um, we had to look at how we could um, get a life cycle for Kubernetes and have everything that someone would need to deploy an end, go, uh, an end cluster, like a production-ready cluster. So that's why we've, we've bought in Helm and we've bought in Rook. Um, and I don't think there's... Um, any, any other companies out there at the moment that has got an end-to-end -end solution like this. So if you look at KOps, it deploys it on AWS, and it's only specific to AWS. We had to think about, we had to be like Switzerland. We have to deploy on GKE, um, Azure, AWS, bare metal, OpenStack, you name it, our customers have got it. We had to have, we have, to have that thought process. Um, so all this put together is what we released. Um, and yeah, there was a whole lot of work the team done, and they need a massive shout out, because we got this all done in three months which was a massive amount of work. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is like the business and the use case of why we did it. Um, come see me later for my talk, and it'll be black belt, mostly terminal, very few slides. And we're going to go through how to, how to use it, how to fix it, um, why we did it. And it's just, yeah, it's just going to be a lot of terminal stuff. But yeah, that's it from me. I'm back over to go. Thanks. You got it? All right. Great. Uh, that's why he works for us, right? It's like, it's impressive. So first of all, uh, as, as you said, it's like the team built this in three months. What to me is much more important that it's built from a workflow perspective of taking in consideration what the right workflow is, using the right components to enable you as proper users to go faster. Right, the fact is like the integration points are obvious. Right, the ability to create a secure environment through configuration to Hira makes it super extensible and flexible. So Docker, Kubernetes, Helm support, 
some great additions that we had. Now, BlueShift was a little bit more than just um, some modules. We also introduced Lumagon. How many of you know what Lumagon is? How many of you used it? Okay. So Lumagon was an initiative that, again, that we launched in May this year, um, which was a spike that a group of, I don't know, I would say four people? Four. Four people did for, I think, three months again to figure out is like, what, is, what does it mean to get information from a container? We all know that it's like we don't want to run an agent on the container. That's, we, we all figured that out. That seems like backwards. Doesn't really fit the mindset. Now it's like, but if you're in a puppet world, what is the moral equivalent of factor for a container? How, how can I figure out what is on the container, what is running? So Lumagon was an initiative that we started that actually did that. It was trying to inspect what is inside a container. It was able to walk up to a container host and then discover what is in there. And right now, it's like if you saw the keynote, it's like we're using that as one of the building blocks in discovery for uh, container uh, discovery. So let me try to, uh, to actually show that. This probably needs a lot of growth. All right. Oh, sorry. Wrong window. OK, let me SSH into one of my boxes. Hopefully that works. Microsoft, what are you doing? OK. All right, if that doesn't, OK, plan B. All right, so what it, that would have shown you if Microsoft, my Azure node would be up, which it has been stopping itself, so that's probably what happened again. Maybe I should pay my subscription. Um, <laughs> so what it does, it runs a container, actually. And you could, I did this before. All right, you can see here the workflow. It's like I do a Docker run of the Lumagon container. And the Lumagon container attaches itself back to the container host and then figures out, it's like, hey, these are all the containers that are running. And sorry about that. So it has a Puppet server running. It has PuppetDB running. It has Postgres running. And it has the Vibrant MITRE running, which is probably a container that has not been named. And then Docker gives you these funny names. So the result is that it actually will post you a link with information about these containers. And so think factor for a moment. What can I find in these containers? So let's look at the Vibrant MITRE. Well, what it actually is, if we can start looking at the container information, and then it overlaps the UI, it actually is one of my own node and containers that it's running. Now, it's like I didn't do a good job actually decorating my container. And also, it's like it doesn't have the information with regards to it's like how this relates to my source code. So let's look at a better one that Garrett built. All right, so let's look at the puppet board. Ah, now we can not only see the host information, we can actually see what packages we run what version control this was coming from. So exactly it allows me to lineate back to the hash and my commit. So I now have correlation between this image, this state in the universe, which ties back to that picture I showed earlier, which is why it is so important. What version it was built, some Docker information, some labels. But we also can see that at runtime, were there things that were changed? And this is actually interesting because you want to be able to figure out is like if there is stuff that you're doing inside your container 
that will might not be optimal. You wanted to add something? I saw you wanted to add something. No, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyhow, so this was a foundational block. This is an open source project. All right, it's a nugget. It's a reusable piece of code that you can use today. We have people using it in their build pipelines. When they build containers, they run it through to Lumagon to figure out and document what they have. It's a good use case. So if you go to discovery, right, you saw this, like you saw the donuts. I'm not just like uh, the UI folks weren't happy when we called them donuts, I think. But, <laughs> um, so, but it, it's like, it shows you the information. It shows that it's like we can find the fact that it's like we have a Docker host and that we have a set of containers. So let's actually go and drill into the container. And it's like, so here we see the Vibrant Miter. And I can actually drill into this, get some facts. Not all the facts are coming through right now. It's a bug in the preview, actually. We're not completely up to par with what Lumicon does, but it's like, ultimately, we'll get there. But the most important thing is, like, we, we work, we, we reason over resources at large. And so in Puppets, everything is rooted inside a node. But from a container world, it's like you want to be able to start wrapping around and say, it's like, hey, this container is associated to this host, and go wrap around. And then ultimately, if we expand this notion in towards the Kubernetes space or the orchestrator space, you can start to get correlated information from discovery about how related containers work with each other. So I can actually wrap around to the node as well. So that's how we've been, been using and leveraging um, Lumagon as a building block. Now, hopefully, this goes back to the right slide. Of course not. And now my mouse. Right. Sorry, I'll orchestrate my thing here. All right. Good. So the other thing that we did, and again, it's like Garrett Rushmore is like has been doing some awesome work here in the open source space is we've been containerizing puppets. Again, as a part to learn, All right? It's like, how, how, what does it take to containerize puppet? It's, it's a multi-beast, multi-headed beast. So it would be an interesting use case, All right? So apparently, if you go to the, the, the hub, it's like it seems that you guys like it. Because the number of pools, and this is not just us pooling, um, and there is many more other variations out there. These are just the ones that we've built. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting things. And personally, um, so when I started, it's like before I interviewed, I wanted to learn more about Puppet. I knew what Puppet was, but it's like I wanted to learn more. And so I started and started with the learning VM. I thought that was a good idea. Actually, it's like after a half an hour, I switched to Docker Compose up to get my Docker cluster going, All right? And that allows me to build up a cluster in 90 seconds. And it's great for testing, All right? You can't run production with it. But I have a question for you, actually. If you see what containers can do, would you be actually interested in hosting Puppet as a set of containers? Show of hands. Because one of the things is like, why am I asking this question? All right. we, we also, as an organization, want to go faster and faster and, and constantly improve. And the speakers this morning in the keynote were very clear about this. All right. you, you constantly want to be able to improve yourself. And that's what I'm challenging the team. That's my role as, as an engineering leader, is help the team also improve and go faster. And figure out, it's like, what is it that we want to do? All right, so the question is, like, do you want to run this in production automatically? You want to do auto update. All right, if you look at what we did with Discovery, Discovery is built as a set of containers that we're hosting in, in, in your environment right now. And one of the benefits of that is it cuts down the matrix of possible configurations dramatically. All right. And it increases the quality, therefore, because there are certain assumptions that we get from running as a container that we wouldn't get if we're just sh shipping you with Tarball. Okay? So where are we going from here? 
Well, there is only thing that I know for a fact. The ecosystem will continue to evolve. And Puppet has to evolve with it. Right? It's like, just like we are adopting containers, building better workflows to support containers, as, as, as Scotty showed you, it's like the, the change is constant. But one of the things is like we're on it, and we're here actually to help you through this journey with tools that we just shown today and with new investments that we're working on. So that said, it's like go talk and see Scott at 315, where he's going to do a deep dive in what he showed. And it's really, really impressive and also a great example of how you can use Puppet and Hira in a very strategic manner that creates flexibility, which aligns very clearly with what the Porsche person was saying this morning. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Probably the other one thing I'll add is that if anyone wants to ask any questions about containers, um, like I am on the community Puppet Slack, so Scotty C. Um, if you've got any questions, any thoughts, anything that you would like as a feature, if you've got pull requests you want to talk about, anything, I am in the Australian time zone, so maybe not in the same time zone as you, but I will get back to you as soon as possible. Don't be shy to talk to us, um, because customer feedback is where we got to with the Kubernetes module now. Um, so more customer feedback and earlier on, you guys voice what you need and what you want. Um, we'd be more than happy to have those conversations anytime. So yeah, if you're on the public community Slack, I'm Scotty C. Um, don't be afraid to, to hit me up and ask me questions or if you want to do pull requests on something and that my team's doing, um, just start talking to me about it and we can like, work on it together to make sure that it gets through. Um, so we really want to like, support the community to help drive us as well. Okay. Any questions? No? We're between you and lunch, I get it. <laughs> All right, have a great rest of PuppetCon. Thank you very much.